I'm Leora Vysotsky. I'm the staff managing director here at the center, which is also run by a faculty board of directors from across our programs. Uh, this year, our board consists of Fernando Lara, Miriam Solis, Martin Hadish, Norea Feliz, and Alex Yeshka. Uh, lunch forums that are in this dialogue format like today are meant to really straddle our disciplines at the school and to explore possibilities for new collaborations hear about different approaches to topics in common or to also debate over uncommon ground. Our presenters today will talk with each other for about 45 minutes, after which we'll open the floor to questions and discussion. Please feel free to raise your hand or put a question or comment in the chat just as they arise and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, I am pleased to introduce our faculty participants today to discuss the role of the designer in society. Our moderator today, Coleman Coker, is director of the Gulf Coast Design Lab, a community-driven design program at UT where advanced design students practice environmental activism by design. The Design Lab has completed over 24 built projects in its eight years, not just on the Gulf Coast, but in India, Australia, the Yucatan Peninsula, and Austin. Coker students, Coker students work, pardon me, has received numerous design awards with both state and local AIA awards, National ASLA Student Design Awards, and Arc Daily's International Student Design Award in 2017. Coleman is Professor of Practice at UTSOA. He's a registered architect with over 30 years in practice, much of that in partnership with Samuel Mockbee as Mockbee Coker Architects. He's a Loeb Fellow at Harvard's Graduate School of Design and a Fellow of the American Academy in Rome. He received recognition from the ACSA in 2019 for his design build work here at the school. Maggie Hansen is an assistant professor in landscape architecture at the University of Texas at Austin. Her work draws on training in architecture, landscape architecture, theater, and contemporary art. From 2014 to 2017, she was director of the Small Center for Community Design, where she guided the center's program expansion in support of an equitable New Orleans through design programming alongside deep community engagement. Her current research investigates how caretaking of space, of shared histories of caretakers, serves to maintain and build community through civic and environmental stewardship. This semester, she's teaching a studio that explores the potential for stewardship of the Blackland Prairie Ecology to address fallow land and social justice in Dallas. Last but not least, Benjamin Ibarra Sevilla is an associate professor of architecture and historic preservation. His expertise involves case studies of ancient mason techniques, stereotomy, descriptive geometry, and architectural geometry informed by form resistant structures. At the core of his research, Ibarra Sevilla examines the transference of knowledge in the context of building construction and historic buildings. In his studios, students explore the intersection between building conservation, adaptive reuse, and the designer's role in economically challenged communities of Mexico and Texas. These studios examine historic buildings and culturally charged places as opportunities for the designer to intertwine the old and the new, investigating how architecture can play a role in improving the built environment of disadvantaged communities. Thank you three so much for being here today. Thank you, Mary. Uh, do, do you all want to show, uh, talk about what you do a bit, or is that sufficient? Uh, how would you all like to play that? You want to show images? Uh, sure. Let, yeah. Um, Just a few. Let's, yeah, let's show. Can I not get the one? Uh, <laughs> should, should I get started? Please, please get started. Yeah. All right, let's do this. <clears throat> All right. Okay, here we are. Um, I'm so excited to be a part of this conversation today. Uh, I just, we each have assembled a couple images to kind of introduce our current work. And um, I thought I would dive uh, right into my current research, uh, which attends to the potential of care practices as tools of design. Um, this builds on my own experience working uh, in community engaged practice, but also I think even before that um, in volunteer efforts uh, that I was involved in uh, in Brooklyn. 
Um, and the bigger question of how we might use these practices of care, which for landscape designers includes uh, stewardship, gardening and horticulture, um, advocacy, uh, asking for new policies, and um, actions of storytelling about uh, place and uh, the regular use of everyday places, <clears throat> excuse me, and how we might use those practices to support uh, other relationships between people and the places that we love. Um, there's a great history of this kind of work in landscape architecture that we don't often talk about uh, that, um, that go alongside uh, the building of physical changes to landscape. And I'm interested in how we can reclaim these tools as essential to our discipline. <clears throat> I think um, it's important to note that uh, while all of the design disciplines are engaged in questions of how we change and how we look towards the future, uh, landscape in particular is engaged with living materials of plants and soils and is um, impacted by the everyday movements of people and the stewardship of those places, uh, shaping growth and change over time. Um, that's why I also think that the tools of landscape, of seeing landscape space as ephemeral and changing, can be so uh, potent for thinking about um, the larger systemic changes that we're interested in. Uh, so how does this impact um, my work here at UT? Last spring, I worked with Gina Ford to lead a studio that looked at multiple ideas of the public, um, multiple communities, histories, non-human species uh, that we would attend to through our design um, proposals for Franklin Park in Boston. Uh, here, Molly Gas Gaspar reconnected the park's edges to the adjacent neighborhoods, which had been physically as well as uh, sort of mentally um, bordered off from the park's uh, entryways and um, also recovered uh, a history of activism and cultural production in the neighborhood. She created a series of solitary reflective spaces and collective lookouts along that park edge. And throughout the semester, we were thinking about different modes of caretaking, everyday use, rituals and gatherings and the uh, regular maintenance of the park and the surrounding neighborhood as um, tools to think about space making. Um, this semester, uh, as Leora mentioned, we're looking at the Blackland Prairie in Dallas as a way of recovering um, this eco region, which is, uh, it needs stewardship and management and change to continue to be a prairie and asking the question of how stewardship of the prairie might uh, revive fallow landscapes in Dallas. Um, here, Taylor Davis has started off the semester mapping historic spatial practices of the 10th Street Freedmen's District as a way of thinking about different um, time scales of daily practice, of seasonal practice, of generational spatial practices that uh, sustained these communities. And um, she's starting to look forward about how recovering uh, uses and management of landscape might uh, bring back the memories of these um, forgotten neighborhoods. And then um, June Landenberger is, is in a, a different area of Dallas where she's uh, looking about how looking at how a prairie stewardship might um, heal damaged landscapes, um, industrial landscapes, and how those same actions might be a way of healing the neighborhood and reconnecting it to those spaces. How can the shared work of stewardship start to um, bring a stronger uh, social connection between neighbors, but also heal a longer relationship to the spaces within the neighborhood that they've been uh, cut off from. Um, each of these projects visualizes uh, systems of policy and spatial practice, which are often invisible in our drawings and um, sees them as actors in physical space and also uses a sort of radical act of noticing as a way of questioning and critiquing uh, our attitudes towards these spaces. Thank you.
Right, you know me, please. All right, very good, very good, Maggie. Thank, thank you very much for for Laura for organizing, to Maggie and Coleman for accepting the invitation and uh, you know getting to have this conversation. Uh, similarly, I am very excited about it and um, and um, it's always a uh, interesting to go second because you are like, oh, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> but uh, that I was briefly going to share a few slides here that when 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 Leora mentioned uh, this topic to me and, and when we had this conversation, I was like, okay, how I, how can I frame what I what I do, what I work on in terms of the, the, the role of the designer in society and building intangible. And uh, perhaps many of you know, my, my work is uh, pretty much on, uh, on, on, on the intersection of history and architecture, pretty much historical buildings and the idea of, um, and in this context, the idea of the intangible right with the notion of, of uh, the conservation, not only of the physical environment, but of course of the intangible environment or the intangible aspects of that environment that have to do perhaps with customs, with crafts, with, um, yeah, and with other types of expressions that the society that created that historical built environment uh, uh, are part of. So in, uh, specifically in the work that you know and that I do in the context of descriptive geometry and and, 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 and the stereotomy and the understanding of a historical ways of conceiving buildings is that a, this notion of the intangible plays a role in the context of the trades and the types of, a, or the different approaches that a, a architects from the past will take in order to what they needed to construct, right? And these, for instance, are drawings in the realm of stereotomy and this country that perhaps for many looks so foreign, but at some point in time, it was the common way of depiction and description of, a, of a different elements within a building. And in that extent, the, uh, the intangible becomes within the discipline of architecture uh, as, uh, uh, as part of its own tradition that in some extent will have or needs to be, if you will, or conserved or presented to, to, to further to other generations. And this of course uh, moves into the aspects of uh, the act of restoration and conservation, conservation itself in which uh, uh, stone masons like uh, the ones that we are seeing right now uh, this is this is literally about 20 years ago or so. Uh, uh, start to um, to transform this information that I just presented to you into something that is tangible, uh, but at the same time uh, and simultaneously looking at this uh, uh, continuation of the trade or continuation of this art, in this case of carving and masonry. As a, a, a as an intangible heritage, as an intangible way of uh, of of expressing uh, uh, skills and, and attitudes towards buildings, that um, uh, at the, again at the end need to be somehow are, are, are preserved, right, and uh, have a continuation for the for future future. In, 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 interventions. And these are the final results of this. Of course, this is an open chapel in Mexico, in Oaxaca, <clears throat> that was part of a restoration project that I did a long time ago, but they stay at the root of this continuation of preservation of the tangible or intangible, and specifically looking at the intangible. And this uh, translates into the uh, studios that I uh, teach as well, where we look at of course, historical structures, historical buildings, and where they present up a, a, a set up a context in which I challenged the students to, uh, as as the title of this of this uh, of this uh, conversation, the role of the designer 
right, in this context, mostly in, in urban environments in which heritage plays not only the role of, um, of uh, preserving the intangible as identity for this, but also yeah. as, a, as a, a potentially Just something that can bring a, a new um, way of, um, a, a new set of, 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 of uh, skills and, and, uh, and thinking also about a, a potentially economical, economic development happening within these uh, communities. So these are, this is one of the buildings that we did uh, a couple of years ago, it's the Hacienda Cocotla, and um, in Puebla, Mexico, that belongs to not only one person, but belongs to an entire community. This is how, um, you know, after a study, the, uh, the, the, build, the students develop documentation and, of course, they looked at an entire building from a holistic manner just to give you a sense of how big that is. So the initial photo that I showed was this uh, chapel over here, but entire uh, hacienda is what remains of, of it is there. But the role of the designer and inverting the, the, the idea of it, how is it that, you know, we can, how we can uh, take a, a, the needs of, of, the, of, of the groups that are under uh, represented uh, and economically challenged and identify the potential in heritage to propel forward some uh, uh, development. So offering the students the opportunity to actually engage uh, with the communities and simultaneously with their heritage in order to see what uh, these possibilities uh, for preserving the tangible and the intangible are. So the students pretty much uh, are looking at this type of problems uh, from a holistic manner, understanding the different components and aspects that they're always with the notion, the idea that something uh, 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 that are driving force that is relying on uh, on the sustainability of these structures is propelling them forward and uh, be a source for development and income. And of, of course, at the end, you know, uh, the implications that they have at the architectural level, right, in terms of inter not only the, the enclosed space or the built environment, but also into even the landscape uh, as well, because uh, all of course, all of this is uh, embedded within the cultural uh, cultural landscape as well. Anyway, so with this, I think I will finish my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thanks, ben -Ami. Maggie. Uh, I'm gonna be very quick because uh, I'm anxious to get into a, a conversation here, so. I'll go ahead and share a screen. Okay, um, I hope you can see that. Uh, Gulf Hills Design Lab, um, I use the term environmental activism by design in um, how we approach our work um, uh, through a public interest, interest design approach of community engagement. That in itself is a kind of activism, getting um, out of the studio, working in a community uh, with a group uh, in, uh, in ways that uh, somehow uh, teach students uh, that design is at forefront, but also uh, the betterment of the citizens within these communities uh, are, are very, very valuable as, as uh, the goal. Uh, we also, environmental activism by design is looking in environmental justice research. Um, we've been looking at uh, communities in Houston, uh, along the uh, Houston Shipping Channel, uh, fence line communities there, primarily uh, minority uh, communities that um, higher cancer rates, uh, uh, leukemia, uh, that sort of thing in children, asthma, those sorts of things. And, and how, how architects um, implicitly play roles in that, how we as designers um, do and what, what we as architects uh, might, might in some way be able to do towards those. Um, also, I like to think of environmental activism by design and what I call small deeds for big problems. Each semester we work with a stakeholder. We try to take on a, a problem of problem solving of something that they're working with. Uh, this is Galveston Bay Foundation. We were working this, this semester. Uh, uh, part of their role is, is uh, the health of the bay 
And so we're helping them, uh, went out two days to help them with um, reestablishing uh, oyster reefs, which cut down on um, uh, uh, erosion around the Bay Edge. So that, that's important. And teaching um, through that, teaching a deep and ecological investigation by the design students. So it's not just giving, but it's also taking. Uh, we work with biologists, uh, ecologists, environmentalists that are talking to our students about these things and why they're doing it, the importance of, of stewardship and care of, of environments. <clears throat> And then um, designing and building places where uh, public ecological literacy is increased. This is the main uh, uh, thrust of our, our program, working with uh, nonprofit stakeholders, uh, primarily on the Gulf Coast, who in some way are reaching out to public schools, communities uh, about ecological literacy, trying to raise that um, stewardship, environmental responsibility. Uh, they, this group here, Artist Boat on Galveston Island, um, this is an outdoor classroom we did for them. They have an aggressive program in, in public schools where um, they go into the classroom two days talking about um, e ecological considerations there in the Houston area. And then uh, bring them out for a day uh, to the landscape, to their coastal heritage preserve. So we've built this outdoor classroom where they can um, uh, teach about that on first hand actually go out and, and look at the bay system, look at the ocean, uh, take samples of the uh, prairie grasses. So that's, that, um, that's a quick summation. And I hope through the conversation, um, I can talk about it some more. But uh, to kick off the conversation, I, I thought um, I'm intrigued by the title that um, uh, Leora uh, charged us with, the role of the designer in society, designing the intangible. I'm curious, Leora, about the intangible, and um, I want to talk about that uh, for a moment and its, its cultural implication and, um, and then get into a conversation quickly. You know, this past year, we've gone through so much, um, uh, it particularly uh, with racial justice issues. Um, it's, it's, I think, come into the forefront now. Um, disparity, economic disparity, looking at... Uh, um, uh, the aspects of uh, economic um, neoliberalism neoliber and what that's caused, the envir environment, ecological calamity, uh, seeing the amount of climate refugees that are growing uh, every year, poverty in many parts of the world, uh, lack of water, adequate nourishment. You know, th those are things that we as architects tangentially um, uh, are, uh, can be a part of. Uh, what is our role in society is, is I think, what um, uh, we're being asked to, to talk about. And um, how do we contribute to that? You know, certainly, um, you know, inefficient buildings, construct, construction waste material, uh, environmentally damaging materials that, um, that get used in buildings we design. Those, those are specific, but, but there are other things to consider, too. Um, profession plays a, a part in a... Uh, a greater society that uh, still in very subtle ways prom promotes uh, racial inequity. Uh, we're still part of uh, environmental injustice as, you know, as citizens. Um, what can we as architects do? How can we uh, step out of our uh, roles specifically as building designers and um, um, community designers, landscape architects, and address, address issues like that? Uh, how can we look at uh, what I think um, we might consider the intangible here as, as Ben Amin referred to um, in working in Mexico, um, you know, ecological de degradation, uh, we do play a role as, as I've said there. So what is the intangible? And um, are we providing the right toolkit for our students uh, in thinking about these in this rapidly changing world? Um, questions of, of are increasingly being asked of this in design schools around the world. What role do we as uh, design teachers, what role do we as the profession play in these um, intangible issues that we're thinking about? So um, Ben, I mean, you, you, you got uh, really into the, the weeds of that when we were talking about your work. What is the intangible? I wonder if we could discuss uh, a little bit. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think building the intangible means as an educator. Uh, how do you see our role uh, and some of the things that I just mentioned um, in society 
uh, that that we might uh, indirectly or, or directly impact. Um, I'm thinking about citizen architects here and, and the role that they can play in a community, both as architects, but also as citizens. So um, I'll just throw that out there and see uh, if we can get that uh, conversation going. Coleman, can I just jump in and ask you to stop your screen share so that we can see oh, the three of, of you talking? Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Did it mean, uh, Maggie? Yeah, okay, yeah, well, well, um, I mean, identifying the intangible, um, it's uh, in the context of, in the context of education, yeah, that's, a, that's a, a, an interesting challenge and, um, Mm. Just, I mean, I, I just bring it back to the identification of the intangible in the context of the, you know, preservation or building conservation. And uh, <clears throat> there is, there is a, a, as in the world heritage, there is a category, right? The tangible heritage and intangible, and many, uh, many sites get the nomination or the denomination or at least the World Heritage sites from the intangible values. The university I went to, Alcalá de Henares in Spain, is 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 not because of the physical environment, it's because of it's because of the the that being one of the oldest universities in Europe has an intangible present and it's an intangible value. So at the end, uh, there are a set of values that everyone uh, will have to be sharing to understand what that is in them, in, and how we share them and how we understood uh, the intangible. Um, uh, I, I mean, I'm looking at, 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 the, at the work that we do with, uh, with the students, I think it has to do with the notion of uh, I think it has to do with self awareness, self awareness of the issues that you just mentioned, Coleman, right? Uh, that uh, need to be discussed within the, the the design context and how that how the, the designer has plays a role in them. And um, and um, yeah, and on the other hand, I think it has to do with the idea of. Uh, Or how can those values can we can propel, propel them forward? How can we preserve them? How can they continue if if necessary? And 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 in what extent we have the tools to do it? It's always it's always it's always hard because the design many times is a situation that comes from the top down, and 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 reversing that order is the is the is the big 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 challenge, and uh, yeah, I want to leave it there. I don't know if, if I'm making sense. Uh, yes, I want to leave it there just to, to get started. Maybe any 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 thoughts? Yeah, um, I I think uh, first it's, it's great to be reminded of um, both of your work and to use that as a as a bigger context that we're all kind of working within these multiple scales. And I think um, part of what came up, especially in Benjamin's uh, slides was the importance of looking at these issues as being embedded within a larger cultural context and a larger um, landscape and ecology that is spatial, right? And I think that that's where um, our tools as designers can be particularly effective at um, revealing some of these uh, invisible um, components that contribute to a space being uh, well-loved, well-used, um, cared for, because it is not only physically beautiful, but it is culturally meaningful. It is full of uh, environmental factors that give back that sustain us in multiple ways. Um, and then also that it's within a, a culture of, um, of making things. I, I think the images of 
sharing food, <laughs> um, the specific tools that uh, we use, that um, the, the labor and technique and skill that is built over time of creating uh, the sort of details that Benjamin was uh, showing to me are, are similar also to the uh, the detail and the care of noticing um, uh, planted form and when you know when plants need particular sustenance or when they need to be pruned that um, we have relationships to the details of these environments that we uh, get trained to see over time. And I think um, for both the history of place, but also for the environmental processes of place, those are often things that we um, don't develop skills of seeing in our regular school. And um, we as designers can help reveal them through our drawings, through giving vocabulary and names to these systems, and then also uh, for advocating um, for them as uh, important components of our communities and of our culture. Um, so I, I think there's an element of literacy uh, and building a shared literacy um, around uh, cultural practices and environments that all of our work shares that starts to get at things that, um, that are so vital, but are often unseen, right? Are not valued because they operate as background, um, but are the difference between one place and another. Yeah, yeah right. I think, um, um, go ahead. If I might just say one more thing that is, a, I think following that trend, but also the, the notion that is, is well in the context of the you know, historical cities and historical context and culturally charged spaces is uh, the, the, the intangible has to do with the, the, not with the container, but with the content, right? Uh, I think that we have this tendency to look at that container solely, right? Because of its richness, because of its character, because of the amount of information that it provides that at some point you know, can be overwhelming and because there is a, a, a somehow a testimony of that history. However, uh, that, that all that becomes uh, empty, becomes vacuum, uh, void, I'm sorry, if, if that content is not there and, and the content in, in specifically in cultural and landscapes, meaning, you know, not only prayers and trees, but cultural landscapes, meaning also the cities, right? The, the, as, part of the, as part of the construction of the landscape is that uh, the culture itself, right? <laughs> so, right? Uh, that, that actually made that possible uh, seems to be an ingredient that needs to be somehow uh, recognized, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, agency, I, I think, is is the the um, condition that ties all three of us <clears throat> together in that trying to to um, establish some sense of agency uh, to our students that that they might not ha have had. Um, an example I'm thinking of with my students um, is working working along the ship channel at the fence in the fence line communities and beginning to understand just the foundation of what's going on there. Um, and once they see that uh, as designers, whether they're working directly on uh, in that neighborhood or not, they can never unsee it again. And it begins to affect their attitude in, in all buildings that they design. Design's at the forefront and in, in I think in all of our conversations, but how you approach it seems to me um, uh, a, a responsibility uh, uh, in working like this in, in, in instilling that sense of, of, of um, understanding the greater issue than, than how the building is part of a larger society, a larger ecological system, you know, including both uh, human and, and natural in that. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think it, it, um, it requires, a, a, you know, a habit of looking um, beyond the edges of the site that you've been given, right? And beyond the edges of the, the facade of the building as uh, Ben Hameen was saying, and, um, and at those multiple scales of impact that each, um, each design 
engages with. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm curious, um, I, I guess this is another question of sorts is, what do you say to your students about these things? Do you, do you uh, directly uh, discuss uh, this sense of agency, this sense of um, responsibility beyond just the uh, design of the building itself and how that building is part of the larger whole and um, what, what is their role as architects in, in doing that? Um, whether it's global uh, upheaval of, of climate crisis or whether it's what's happening here in, in, in um, Austin with, with uh, you know, water shortage we had a couple of weeks ago, those sorts of things. So um, I'm curious, do, do you, how do you approach your students about that uh, beyond just the art of architecture, you know, and uh, thinking more about the um, uh, uh, societal uh, aspects and responsibilities? Mm -hmm. Thoughts? I think um, I, this is reminding me, I, so I'm, I'm teaching a seminar on, on um, care and design this semester and I'm really, lucky to work with such an incredible group of students from all different disciplines at the school here and a couple of students who are outside of the school. We were just talking about uh, this very question yesterday. Um, and that uh, I, think, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, we are designers, but we're also participants in the places that we live in and the places that we work and that uh, our observations as uh, people who walk down the street and who engage with other people living in these places are just as valuable as the, um, the measured drawings that we're making. And so finding, finding ways to uh, use the skills that we have of observation and participation that we have as um, as human beings and as uh, neighbors is, is as important and sometimes more valuable um, as data points than, uh, than the, the technical skills that we have as designers, which we, we still have to deploy. That, that's our role, right? We're invited because we're designers, but, um, but we also need to attend to those, uh, those other um, other responsibilities to uh, the other human people um, we're engaging with, those other flows of, of information. I, I, I you know, I think in, if, in also in my experience, when I, I think I see a couple of, of, of different, a uh, couple of ways of, that we approach this. And I think it comes a lot from the risk from the response that the students have to the environment. Just to give you a sense, when I work in Mexico, uh, I feel much, much of, more of a responsibility to mm -hmm. somehow introduce, to present, to, to, to give a sense of what is, what is happening, especially when they're looking at communities. First, I have to say that I think the tool that I like to use the most, although you know, sometimes I, there are some limitations. Is definitely this direct contact with the, with the, right, <laughs> with, with, with whomever we are working for or, or working with, if you will, and got to uh, get to some some type of exposure to to this uh, <clears throat> to this uh, very important component of the whole mm -hmm. process. But then, well, of course, going to, to Mexico will have some level of interpretation, of course, the language and why not, but also, you know, culturally speaking. But I also, right now I'm working on a project on Montopolis. Uh, uh, it's also what it was, uh, uh, an African-American school established back in the early 1900s and becoming you know, now a, a, an icon of the, of the neighborhood. And I have been extremely and very pleased and surprised of the attitude and engagement that the students have shown, at least in my studio, with regards to uh, understanding and being aware of the, the context in which they are working. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, and in, in that extent, I, I think that my, the role is, 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 is more as a facilitator and trying to 
you know, bring the different the different people, the different uh, others or, 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 or groups that are involved as much as possible. And of course, in this context, within the means that we have right now, which is what we are seeing right now, right? But, uh, but I, I, I have to recognize that uh, uh, students uh, nowadays have, um, I think that in that extent, much more awareness and, 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 and tools and access to information that uh, is, is very helpful to give them a context and to, to have a, a better understanding of, of where is it that they are, are working and what are the elements that they, they want to work with. And also the sense of responsibility, mm-hmm. uh, I think it has been extremely, you know, very, very good in, in terms of the re- their response. And I, I have to say that perhaps that it's making this type of, it's slightly easier for us <laughs> for this, you know, when presenting these projects because uh, the students all have, have uh, some tools and, and, and some interest and, and, and and not to, to get to some information in a good way. Yeah, I, I agree with my own, uh, own experience uh, that very thing happens. I think what ties uh, the three of us together, you and, and uh, historical preservation, Maggie and landscape is, is that we're both working within the community, uh, teaching design uh, on the ground, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And in many ways it makes it so much more difficult, but I think at the same time, it, it is, uh, a greater understanding of what those students will be facing uh, uh, once they're in the profession, you know, and something like uh, I think you're you're mentioning that I mean is is it even taking it further, gaining trust within a community um, instead of just blindly going in and and uh, imposing the will of the designer, uh, building building a relationship, beginning to understand what what that. Um, uh, neighborhood that community uh, is, such as Montopolis for you. We're working in Montopolis as well um, for a group of ecology action that uh, people in that yeah. neighborhood use quite a bit. And it's all about um, yeah. recycling uh, and, and, and so forth and how how that becomes an educational tool for that community. And we're um, trying to get my students to understand how they're part of that larger issue and not just designing that building there on the site. Mm-hmm. But the building really becomes a vehicle for, for something larger uh, that reaches out to the community. Um, it's tentacle, so to speak. So um, in that sense, um, I, I, think, I think we're very similar in, in, in trying to approach uh, design teaching that way. Uh, yeah, you know, I, mean, I, I think within well, that context, it's always, you know, a, what I have been learning lately is the, the, the notion of, of the limits, right? The limits that we have in, in, in that extent and mm-hmm. ba- make it very clear for, for the expectations to the community and to, to the stakeholders and to the students and, at least, and also to myself, <laughs> right? In what extent, you know, a semester project can, you know, tackle different types of situations and how far you really can go uh, how much trust you can build. I mean, this requires another level of thing. If there are issues or situations that require a complete different level of involvement that unfortunately, uh, at least, uh, you know, in my experience, the, the, the semester, semester which is not six months, right? The, which pretty much means six months, the four and a half, I mean, the 15 weeks that we have. <laughs> Are, uh, are, are difficult to handle. But um, I think it's also important to recognize those, those, those limits or limitations uh, uh, and in order to, to fulfill, make sure that everyone has a clear understanding of the expectations and the, the outcome of this, of this experiment, right? Mm-hmm. Because there are some type of experiment, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's so it's so essential to building real trust, right? To be able to be clear about what you're what you can do, and then making sure that you do the things that you say you're going to do. Um, and I think that it's it's hard when we are excited to try to solve a set of problems um, to be honest about what is achievable within the fifteen weeks of the semester, or even. Um, what's achievable with our 
specific tools of design, right? We can't, we cannot do it all. Um, and so figuring out how to communicate that uh, clearly to community partners, clients, um, students, and especially to ourselves is so essential. But I also think um, like Coleman was saying, it's it, like those relational skills, the skills of communication and trust building and um, understanding and spending time with people is uh, those are essential tools for designers, even if we're not engaged in public interest design later, right? They, they have been just as helpful for me in the you know, high-end residential projects that I've worked on as in the community engaged projects. And um, they are the tools that uh, we need to um, build and rely on, uh, but are often um, not, uh, not talked about or valued as essential um, to our profession. Right, uh, yeah, 15 weeks is never enough. <laughs> no. Uh, Get, get this going very well. I, Leora, I ask that we um, open it up to questions um, that anyone might have. So, um, questions from uh, listeners. I, I really enjoyed uh, your presentations. It's, uh, it's really inspiring to see the, the work uh, that you're doing with the students. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I have a few questions. Uh, I, I mean, one, uh, one was like, just uh, uh, what, what you were talking right now. Uh, I mean, I, I cannot imagine as an instructor, as a design instructor also, well, I can imagine I've only done like maybe one studio that, uh, uh, in, in this kind of vein, but the level of pressure also to deliver, no? And, and how Maggie was saying, uh, once you engage with the real community and there's a real, um, there's a real uh, deadline, no, and 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 how, uh, and I guess it comes with experience, uh, no, uh, to 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 be able to determine uh, the the kind of scope of the studio and how much. Uh, but I was wondering how how you deal with those um, with the students uh, with those pressures, no, where, where, from from the students from the community, uh, etc. Great question. You know, it's, it's funny Any because, of you three? Yeah. It's funny because it's, so when, when you start the project, I think that has happened to Unary as well. When you start the project, you're so excited. And uh, then then you are in the middle of the project, all these expectations from everyone, you know, merging, popping up, and you are like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> Why did I get into it? Okay. Right? <laughs> Uh, but otherwise, there is no fun, right? I mean, the whole. Otherwise, it doesn't make it. Like, it just doesn't make much sense to, to even do it, doing it. Um, um, and I think lately it has been also, you know, as I mentioned, the response from the students, at least from my experiences, that, you know, to tone down and understand that, make them understand that, yeah, they are responsible, but you know, to. So much was different to what Colin and us, right? Because there is a clear deliverable there and needs to be finished in one way or another. Context, you know, there is also some type of, you know, or feeling of being overwhelmed when there is this risk, when you throw this responsibility to the students and say, look, this is not, and this is who, and this is that, and they're actually going to the review and, you know, I'm gonna be seeing what you are doing and the work that you might are doing might be in one extent or not have an impact. In one of the projects that we did last year in, in Puebla, yeah, we did a very ambitious project, but now part of it built, right? So giving that continuation is, also, is, is, is something that, okay, you say, look, this could happen, that has happened, but, uh, but also controlling the expectations is definitely a challenge yeah. for everyone. Maggie, would you like to explain? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, at, at least uh, when we were working in the community um, community design center in New Orleans, uh, we had different sort of modes of engaging and, and different specific outcomes that um, we knew we could achieve within a set period of time or, or could get close to. Um, 
And often uh, we, we had to be just very clear that our role was, um, you know, this part of a project that was, you know, a project that's five, 12, 20 years in the making, right? And, um, and that we were going to be very uh, tactical and, and sort of nimble in starting a conversation um, either through a physical intervention or through a new way of seeing a space and the possibilities of a space uh, rather than fix, you know, like we're not gonna be able to fix the whole thing. And, um, and that takes, for us, it took a lot of uh, coaching up front with our community partner to make sure that we were aligned and where we were trying to go. And then also sustain conversations with the students along the way, again, to just reinforce those expectations of what we can achieve, what's reasonable, what we, you know, what do you promise? And then also how our role sometimes is more powerful in asking questions about why things are the way that they are rather than promising solutions. And I think that's where you can start to set something in motion that then can be picked up by um, a professional design firm, can be picked up by policymakers, or can be um, the sort of seed of change for longer sustained uh, work. Yeah. Uh, just quickly, Noray, uh, you mentioned um, experience. It does take experience. You, you just don't do a project like this the first time. Um, I've done quite a few, but I have to admit every semester, I say, this is the one that's gonna blow up. You know, this is the one that's just not going to get, get done. And we have very specific goals in mind. When we, we set out to uh, do a project uh, of built work, we know it has to be finished. We have that responsibility. So I, I try to instill in the students a sense of investment. You know, this isn't just, well, I forgot that detail uh, or I didn't get to that detail in my final review or that rendering. You can't do that in these, you, that sense of investment and also working as a group in a studio, that's very important too. We start out designing individually and gradually through a process, um, uh, work, the students work as, as one unit and um, they have to depend upon each other. And that's what they're going to be doing um, in offices uh, once they're out of, out of school. And it gives them an opportunity to, to begin to understand that too. So those are some of the other intangibles that happen in a studio like this that might not um, in, a, in a more typical studio. Yeah, very good question. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Oh, hello. Um, hello. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I have two questions if there's time. Um, for Professor Hansen, um, you started by talking about the role of the landscape towards the future and uh, like getting engaging the community and stuff. So, and then you, we were talking about the role of the designer in general. So how do you see the role of the landscape designer in the climate change and especially in the USA? Like for example, in the Scandinavian countries, they're like more aggressive and they take actions, um, let's say, much more than the USA and the USA much more than us here in the Middle East. And for example, like in France, this uh, very aggressive project that they're going to do in the Champs-Élysées, if you've seen it. So how do you see the role of the landscape designer uh, with respect to climate change uh, in the future? Well, this is the first question. If I have time, I'll ask Professor Lucon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for um, asking a very easy question. <laughs> um, no, but uh, I think um, I think that this is this is where it uh, our um, ability to uh, visualize our uh, relationship to landscape uh, systems um, is is an important tool for us to advocate for really needed change. Um, our, our studio is participating in uh, the Green New Deal Super Studio, which is a, an initiative across uh, the United States. And there, there are also some um, folks outside of the US who are engaged in this uh, multi-university conversation across um, uh, ideas of how design can um, influence larger scale policy decisions 
as well as um, implementable uh, project-based proposals. And that um, we, especially as landscape architects, are, are working at the scale of our particular site, but we're also having a conversation that is about um, bigger ideas of how policy shapes space, how it shapes what we're able to do and um, determines our role as designers as well as, as citizens. And so I, I think um, it's necessary uh, for us to be um, advocates for the bigger system changes that we know need to happen, as well as attentive to the specific site considerations of whatever project we've been hired to work on. Um, and, and that I think goes back to the earlier conversation about looking beyond the boundaries of our particular site to the larger, much larger, even political context that we're working within. Um, but we can, we can help feed those by, by visualizing impacts as well as visualizing the opportunities for change. Thank you. Thank you. You had another question you'd like to ask? Yes, okay. Um, uh, you were talking about racial justice and economic disparity and these issues that are raised, being raised right now. Um, before coming here, I was watching just like an event, uh, planning futures that is uh, uh, done by Columbia University. And it, uh, one of the, there are four panels and the concept about this is all about how urban planners um, they're all talking about they're going to change their vision of the future because of COVID, because of uh, what happened with George Floyd, because of all this racial injustice, not just what happened in the USA, but this racial injustice is happening. Like, for example, there was one panelist, she talked about what's happening in Beirut. We, we, like here, it's a turmoil. Everybody, like I don't know, like there are 20 panelists, I watched two, um, is talking about a problem that's happening all around the world. And they're talking how urban planning is going to change and how they're teaching it. And now you talked about racial justice, economic disparity, and we have to plan for uh, environmental um, like activism and integrated. How do you, see, and you talked about the role of the architect. How do you see the role of the architect is going to change and are you going to like apply, how, like, mm, I don't know. Uh, teaching architecture in a different way, like there's thinking in urban planning is going to change. Is architecture is going to be affected too by these things? Thank you. Did, did you ask that question of anyone specifically? Or, uh, yeah. um, I don't know. <laughs> you're, free to do, you're free to answer all. <laughs> free for all. Thank uh, you. Yeah. I, I, I'll just say quickly, I, I'm not an urban planner, you know, architect, teaching architecture. But um, you know, I, I try to uh, also do a seminar, uh, not just the studio, um, to really discuss how we as architects can begin to affect change. And um, it, it may not be specifically through a building, it might be working within your community. You never, you never walk out of your, your skin as an architect. You know, it, it, it's more than just a, a, a vocation, it, it's a part of your life. And, um, how students become informed in that also does affect how they design and how they begin to see their world as designers um, in, in a different way. And, and I'll let others respond to that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting because uh, I have been, um, I mean, I have been involved with, when I go to Mexico, we, we the local university as well as part of this notion to the reality and also have an internal voice right someone who knows better the reality at, at, at the peer to peer with the students uh, when I when we plan these studios I talk to the <clears throat> to the instructors and in that the es Universidad de las Americas in Puebla they have um, they have a, a group of, 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 of faculty who are um, dealing with this type of issues and they try to bring this social awareness or, or equity or however you want to call it to the students, right? Uh, but the students who are, um, I don't know if this is going to answer your question open, just a, not another one, but 
the, uh, the, the group of students who do this, uh, go to this university, come it's a private university, well of families whose, um, whose parents may sometimes have, uh, you know, are developers or are involved in developing you know, large properties within the city. So they send them to the university with the expectation that they will be prepared to be able to design these large developments that have nothing to do with what we were talking about. So the students are like, the students are, when they when they are presented to this, they do it so often, it's not that they don't like it, but they start to do it so often that the university is starting to see that there is a lack on teaching the traditional way of it, right? Where you teach the student to do the, the big, you know, skyscraper, uh, apartment building or large, and that's something that they feel the responsibility to actually offer because the type of you know students that attend that university also are looking for that experience. They are like, okay, another community in, in engagement project. I mean, come on, where am I going to learn the things that I was supposed to? <laughs> anyway, so I think that yeah, I think that uh, there are things that uh, definitely going to change in some extent. And uh, the, as I'm saying, I, I have been saying, and I will just reiterate, you know, I think somehow that is happening because the students, I feel, have much more tools and awareness these days that they will have uh, before. Is happening. That's happening, and I think there is a responsibility to also in some to to provide a, a broad education and, and to provide a, a sense of okay, these are all the different scales in which the discipline operates, right? Or different in which the discipline operates, and uh, there's the palette that you have to choose for. Some of my students this semester are like, I want to follow this path. I want to be socially engaged, engaged and I want to, if you are a good architecture for the economically challenged, but others who not, who don't. And I think all those, all those will coexist at least for the you know immediate future. Is that going to change radically? Mm, that's something that I think, I don't know if I have the answer to that, but I think the important thing here is just to, to offer that palette of choices and let this, everyone to fit or place. Yeah, I think I, I think the um, the there are there are and have been conversations about uh, changes in the way that we teach design um, that are ongoing, uh, and um, it is important because architecture, landscape architecture, as well as planning have all been uh, parts of, um, part and uh, deeply in, embedded in processes of segregating cities, of determining um, the, the way that uh, different neighborhoods are cut off from resources or marginalized or are not invested in. And um, these are, part of our disciplinary histories that we need to engage with. Uh, we don't know the, the ways of healing these um, histories, but we do need to engage with them and grapple with them. And it also is important to um, be able to read and understand those histories, read into the environment uh, that, um, space is shaped by uh, a series of policy decisions that have been a part of design and have been a part of our, our city's um, fabric that also structure the everyday lives of um, inhabitants of those places. So as much as we can start to grapple and engage with the layered histories of our places, we can start to identify ways of um, intervening and designing towards uh, um, remedies or uh, uh, repair of those wrongs, right? And um, and I think it, it's uh, it's going to take multiple different disciplines to try to address those issues, and that's where the relationships um, with communities are essential, and these relationships across disciplinary boundaries are really essential to to come up with new approaches. Thank you. 
All right, well, we're right at studio time. So I think I'm gonna let everyone go now, but I just thank you so much. What a nice way to end the week before break. <laughs> I really appreciate all your time and thanks for everyone attending. Um, check back in two weeks. We have a PhD student presenting uh, right after break. So look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you, thanks, everyone. everyone. Thank you guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.